I want to have a discussion about encoding and decoding because as crazy as this may sound, I believe these are the two most important building blocks for all of data engineering. I think we should begin the discussion by going back to fundamentals and asking ourselves what we mean by data. Let's say that we are at a concert. What kind of data could we gather about this concert? Keep in mind that by and large, data is any information about the world which we can collect, use and share. Well, the first one that comes to mind is obviously recording pictures and recording audio of the performance. We can combine this together and obtain a video. We could also think about other features that are recordable, such as the opinions of audience members during the concert, the smells around the room, or the price of drinks at the bar. And I'm sure you could come up with a host of other things. But for now, let's keep it simple and focus on the music being played. First, we need to capture the sound in a format that can be communicated to other people. We could try listening to the concert and imitating the performance. However, even if we are particularly musically gifted, our interpretation will be rather inaccurate. We simply don't have the same voice as the singer, the same instruments as the band, nor do we have a room with a resonance similar to that where the concert is happening. This is how people actually used to record concerts for thousands of years. But in the last few hundreds, things have changed. What we consider one of the most accurate ways to record sounds is to use a microphone. A microphone uses a simple analog encoding technique whereby the sound wave hits a diaphragm which is attached to a wire inside a magnetic field. The subsequent movements of this wire in the magnetic field create an electrical current which encodes the amplitudes in the form of an analog signal. Once we've produced the signal, we need to turn it into a digital signal so that we can store it in the memory of a computer. This is done by taking a sample of the signal every few microseconds and encoding the values we sampled into a binary format. Both of these processes are ways of encoding our data and they have some associated metadata that will allow us to decode the data back to its original format. When sampling the analog signal, our, our metadata is the sampling frequency. By knowing how often we took samples and knowing that these samples were periodic, we can later use them to reconstruct an approximation of the original sound. When translating these samples into numbers, our metadata is the equation that tells us how to go from a binary representation to a number and vice versa. During both of these steps, some information about our original data is lost. When sampling the analog signal, we lose all the amplitude information between the moments when we sampled. When transforming the amplitudes into a binary representation, we lose an amount of accuracy regarding their value, since numbers on a computer are discrete, whilst the values of the amplitudes can be fought off to be virtually continuous. So there we have two examples of encoding algorithms and their associated metadata. What you may notice is that both of these are what we'd call Lucy encoding algorithms. 
in that some of the data is lost during the encoding. Decoding the data into its original format will only yield us an approximation rather than the original data. Generally speaking, encoding can be classified into loosey and looseless. Next, we get into some code and I'll show you some examples of looseless encoding. All right, let's get into some code. I'll go ahead and assume that you have a basic Python free environment set up and FMPG installed. If not, pause the video for a minute and take a look at the notes. Next, we'll install some libraries using pip. So we'll be needing PyTube um, for downloading the audio of YouTube, Wave for working with the .wav file and NumPy from, for um, better operations with number arrays. I'll just copy paste the download audio function here. Uh, this essentially takes a stream of audio from YouTube, uh, downloads it in a file called audio.mp4 and then converts that to WAV. And the reason we are using WAV, the reason we are using FMPG to encode the MP4 into WAV is just because um, it's much easier to translate that into a numerical array. So next we'll define a function called get amplitudes and this will be used to transform the, uh, the audio that WAV file into an entity we can work with inside of Python. So we'll open that file as WFP wave file pointer and first we'll use um, and we're we're doing that using the wave library so first we'll get the the frame rate uh, also known as the sampling frequency the number of samples per second um, and now that we know this we can do stuff like for example skip the first 50 seconds of audio so just move the read cursor essentially past 15 seconds which is 15 times the sampling frequency we'll be working with 25 seconds of audio here um, and that's just because I want to skip the, the silence at the beginning of the video and the song is quite repetitive so you know we, we can we can just use the first 25 seconds of it and you know it'll be fine um, less data to work with so uh, I will read those into a binary format and then I will use a numpy functionality called from buffer to translate that binary buffer into an array. Um, this array will have elements of type int 16. We could also wor work with something like int 8, but we would lose some of the precision, so the encoding would be loosey. Or we could work with int 32, but that would be pointless because we don't have enough accuracy to need in 32, we just need in 16. So next we'll split our amplitudes into channels because this is a stereo type of audio, it has two channels. So all the even numbers we can, or all the even indexes in the array, we can consider channel one and the odd index is channel two. And finally, we'll return the sampling frequency, the two channels, and that should actually be enough uh, to encode our video back into WAV. So this is an example of looseless compression. We haven't lost any information here. So as, as you can see here, we'll only work with one of the channels. Again, this is just to make our life easier. We could do the exact same thing with the second channel or we could try combining the channels into one. Um, I won't call the download audio function myself because I've already ran that before and it takes a while to finish. And then finally, just to show you guys that all of this is working, I will use the length of the amplitudes divided by the sampling frequency to get the duration of, uh, of the audio sample we have here and that should be 25 seconds. So just you know, open up a terminal and then type Python free and the name of your file 
and if you have everything working correctly you should see the duration of our sample is 25 seconds first let's look at our amplitude data you'll notice here that some of the values are positive and some of the values are negative that's because we can think of sound waves as being made up of peaks and valleys the encoding we have right here chooses to represent the lack of sound as zero the peaks as positive numbers and the valleys as negative numbers however our data would be equally valid if we wanted to represent our amplitudes as positive numbers. For this, we could define a simple encoder. Keep in mind that an encoder can be thought of as any function that takes in some data and returns a new representation of that data, plus optionally some metadata. We could have a rather pointless, I would say, encoder that makes our whole signal positive, which would only need to return one piece of metadata, the absolute value of the minimum amplitude, and that would allow us to decode back the original signal. A decoder, I should mention, is essentially a function that takes in some data and some metadata and returns the original representation of the data. In this case, it's rather easy to define, as you can see on the screen. Another way of encoding this data would be by getting the absolute value for each amplitude. This representation would allow us to easily answer questions about the loudness of the song. For example, here's how we get how we'd get the time for the loudest sample taken. The obvious disadvantage with this encoder is that to decode this representation back into its original format, we'd need to store quite a lot of metadata in the form of all the indices of the negative values. The correct encoding can allow us to completely shift the way that we can interpret and operate with our data. For example, we can use what we call a Fourier transform to transport this data that's currently in the time domain into the frequency domain. This is a two-step process. First, we'll compute the uh, discrete Fourier transform, what we call the DFT, uh, by using the fast Fourier transform, that's the FFT algorithm provided by NumPy. Then, based on the length of the signal, we'll get some frequency buckets, which represent frequencies in hertz, uh, which consti will constitute our x-axis of sort, so we can map the FFT values to those frequencies. Um, you don't necessarily have to understand this. Uh, if you haven't taken a signal processing class, it might seem a bit alien to you what we're doing here. And if you want to learn more about it, you can take a look at the notes below. It's beyond the scope of this course. So this representation here, uh, the frequency representation, is quite useful to us. Because we can do stuff like filtering frequencies, for example. So this kind of representation of a signal might be used by, say, a digital sound card in order to make the bass more powerful or apply a particular effect but only on the treble, only on the high notes, or turn down the volume but do that only for the mid-range. So let's go ahead and plot this FFT. Alright, let's take a look at our graph here. First thing you might notice is that it's symmetrical on, along the x and y axis don't really care about why that is we can just zoom in on one of the quadrants to get all the insights we need here and if you zoom in what you'll see here is the amplitudes for various uh, frequencies in our song so essentially you will be able to see 
what are the most important frequencies in this song. I want to look at this because it can give us an interesting insight into how someone who's not a musician or in general someone who's not necessarily trained in the specific domain where the information is gathered can use encoding in order to get more information about the data in order to access insights that may otherwise only be available to a, predict a practitioner of the specific domain or who may not be available at all to anyone if he or she was looking at the data in its standard encoding. So the first thing we might be able to notice here is a pattern of most peaks having a correspondent peak at twice the frequency. Let's take here, for example, this peak at around 988 to 90. And if we look further down the x-axis, sure enough, we'll find a peak here at around 1980. Uh, another example, we have this peak here at around 82. And if we look further down, we'll find another peak at around 164. And that might be a bit of a curious observation if you've never played an instrument or studied musical theory. The reason why that happens is because when a string vibrates, that string will produce what we call harmonics. So if that string is tuned into a C5, for example, it will also produce a C6 and a C7 and a C8 and a bunch of other notes that are one octave higher or two octave higher or x octave higher than the note the string is tuned into and what an octave means is a note with a frequency twice as high another insight we may be able to gather uh, at least if we open up a table of musical of uh, frequencies of musical notes in hertz that is is we can look at some of our peaks. So let's take, for example, here 1,112 to 5. It's kind of hard to to specific to, to place the cursor on the peak exactly. Um, but, you know, around 1,108. And sure enough, we can see here around 1,108 the note uh, C6 sharp. Let's take another peak, the one we looked at before. So this one at around 82. And if we go up in our chart at 82.41, we find a note E2. So that's one way someone who's not musically trained at all can actually look at a song and tell you what key the melody is in or what are the main notes being played. Um, these, these are obviously quite basic insights but if you look at the at the frequency plot of of um, of a song more and more, you'll notice other patterns. So you might notice the kind of interplay between notes that denote various types of genre and make them sound pleasant, that give them their harmony. Or you might notice the particularities of various instruments. So yeah, that's that's essentially why it can be useful to encode your data in different ways because it, it can actually help you um, gather interesting insights about your data that you wouldn't spot in, in a million years where you're looking at the original encoding. Another way to use an encoding is in order to encrypt our data. For many other types of encoding, you can take a guess at the original data just by looking at the encoded data even if you don't have the metadata required to decode it. Encryption, however, focuses on making the um, encrypted data, the encoded data, as unrelated to the original as possible. Unless the correct cipher, uh, which I might also call a password or a key, is known, you don't stand a chance at guessing something even remotely close to the original data. For this type of encoding, 
the metadata required by the decoder is a or should be a secret key or password. A very common utility used for encrypting is GPG. So let's say you want to encrypt some super secret file, let's call it secret.txt. Um, we simply encode it by running GPG minus C and then supplying a passphrase. Whoever wants to decode this file will have to in turn supply the correct passphrase in order to get at the original data. Lastly, one type of encoding that we've all used countless times is compression. We'll be talking a lot about compression in the following lessons, but in principle, it's a very simple concept. All that compression tries to accomplish is to encode the data in such a way that the resulting representation is smaller. There are many techniques we can use to do this, but it usually boils down to two important co concepts. Creating a dictionary of common sequences and mapping our original data to that dictionary and representing repetitive sequences as a loop or multiplication. So rather than representing a string of seven Bs as the original form, so just writing B, 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 etc., we'd be representing it as seven times B. Whilst encoding and decoding might seem like obvious concepts to anyone, I think people fail to realize how many problems can be reduced to just finding a good way to encode or decode some data. Both the digital and the material world contain a surprisingly large amount of devices and concepts which are essentially just glorified encoders and decoders ranging from our eyes to our sound cards and speakers to our monitors, our keyboards, our writing systems, our ears, our tongues and in some ways even large parts of our own brain. So that concludes this lesson and I thank you for sticking through this whole time. I know that for many of you this material might seem quite basic, but it's a good practice to lay out some foundation and some terminology before venturing into more complex concepts. Have a good day!